Hey, welcome back, everyone. We'll close the door soon, so if you know someone who really wants to follow this lecture, please let them know that we are starting. Okay, we have Katie here from Financial Times. Uh, Katie, your bio says that you are uh, uh, the one who makes uh, tools for your employees inside uh, yeah. Financial Times. What kind That's of tools correct. are those? Um, so I work in a group called Internal Products. So we build tools for people who work at the FT. So for example, we built a tool for the new GDPR regulation and recently to handle subject access requests and erasure requests. Yeah, beautiful. But uh, your talk will be about something else. So I'll yes. give you the floor now. Thank you very much. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. One second. It's not skipping slides. It's the screen there's frozen. Yes, that might be better. Always good to have a technical difficulty before the talk. Okay, we'll start again. Good afternoon, everyone. So has anyone in the audience ever come across an error page like this before, where it says, hang on a sec, our site's experiencing more traffic than usual, but you know, you should be able to get back to shopping shortly. Raise your hands if you have. Okay, so there's quite a few of you in the audience. And I did some research about this, and it turns out that it's fairly common. Even the most reputable sites display this type of error message about not being able to handle the level of traffic that's hitting their application. Even Amazon. On Amazon Prime Day, as I'm sure you can all imagine, um, users were going on this site and there was this huge spike in traffic and they were, users were facing this similar error page. They couldn't access the site to make the purchase that they really wanted to make. But going back to the jQuery experience, I really have to be honest about it. I was slightly embarrassed, if not disappointed, when I went on the site I was thinking about my personal user experience, not being able to make the purchase I wanted to make. But I never thought about it from the other perspective. I build websites just like the ones above. And never once did I think, could my users be having a similar experience? Hi. My name is Katie Koshland, and I'm an engineer and technical lead at the Financial Times. The Financial Times is one of the world's leading business news organizations, recognized internationally for its authority, integrity, and accuracy. And today, I'm going to talk about my load testing journey. And I will aim to cover the core concepts behind load testing. I will start with the challenge. And this is how I came across the topic of load testing. I will then go on to discuss how you can get started with writing your own scripts and what it really means to load test your application. I'll then go on to explain how you can use the metrics from your load test to help identify a performance issue within your application. And then I'll go on to talk about the troubleshooting techniques we use at the FT to help resolve these significant performance issues that we face when we build applications. 
And then finally, what I'll do is I'll conclude with some practical outcomes. So first, the challenge. I recently finished a three-month secondment in the operations and reliability engineering team at the FT. And what they were doing was they were developing something called the BizOps API. The purpose of the BizOps API was to provide a central store of all business information at the FT. And here you can see, this is the model illustrated. And this is the kind of information you could retrieve from the BizOps API. So there's information about systems, how those systems relate to each other, and then how those go on to relate to groups and people who work across the FT. And so it was really important for us to be able to understand the technical limits of this application as it was going to be used across the FT very frequently. So that was my challenge. It was about testing the technical limits of our node application. But it was more specific than that. Could I answer the following three questions? Will our application crash? If so, can our application recover? And what exactly happens to that user experience? Once we have found the application's limit and pushed past it, you know, does it recover quickly or does it cause this catastrophic meltdown? And what I was told was that this answer could be found by load testing my application. So I guess let's start with what exactly is load testing? A colleague of mine recommended this excellent talk by someone called Jad Meucci, where he describes load testing in simple terms. It's about simulating ordinary user activity and then applying enough stress until it reaches failure. I really liked this definition, but it kind of led me to that next question, which is, how can you apply that so-called stress to the application? So what you need to do is, you first need to decide on a testing framework. There are many frameworks out there, including popular ones like Apache Bench, Artillery, Work, Gatling. But what I decided was to go with Artillery. And it was really for five reasons. First, it could be installed using NPM. Um, because it was a node application we were developing, it meant we could install it and get started very quickly. Next, what it allowed you to do was customize JavaScript code within your scripts. And this was particularly helpful in situations where what we wanted to do was generate random write queries. So what you could do was write it as a separate JavaScript function, import it into your script, and then the function could get called every time a virtual user was to make a request. And it was also really helpful if you wanted to write separate functions, for example, that would set the headers or cookies for each virtual request. Here you can see an example and a snapshot of when we set headers for this particular API. Another great benefit was that scripts could be configured using YAML. And above is a snapshot I had written in YAML, and you can see by writing it in YAML, it makes the scripts very easy to read, write, and maintain across the team. And you can see here that I'm calling the set headers function I mentioned previously. And it's also targeted towards continuous integration. I unfortunately didn't have a chance to implement this, but this is something that's really interesting and definitely something I would do in the future. So 
if performance is a high priority within your application, what you can do is you can configure your continuous integration, let's say Circle CI, and it can run your script each time you trigger a build. In this way, what it allows you to do is it allows you to detect any regressions within your application at each point in the development process. And finally, it provides detailed metrics. And I'll go on to ex explain this shortly. So once you've decided on the testing framework that's suitable for your application, the next thing you need to think about is you need to decide on the type of requests that are hitting your application. So what your test scripts need to do is they need to be able to represent ordinary user activity within your scripts. So one way to do this is to think about the common user journeys that might be hitting your application and try to replicate that exact behavior made by your virtual users in your script. And then what you have is you have your virtual users mirroring the exact behavior made by your real users. And once you've done that, you need to decide on the shape of load that would be hitting your application. You're probably thinking, what exactly do I mean by the shape of load? Take this graph above as an example. It illustrates the shape of load that was hitting the ft.com homepage during the 2017 election results. And what you can see here is that the shape of load changes drastically over a period of time. So we, what we have is we have x across We've got time across the x axis, and then we've got across the y axis the number of virtual users. And what you can see here is that there are peaks where there's this huge number of concurrent users per second, and then there's troughs where there's a very low level of concurrent users per minute. So what you really want is you want your scripts to be able to capture this type of different load that could potentially be hitting your application. And this is very challenging, and it can be very difficult. But you know, if your application is already in production, you might already know that shape of load. A situation, for example, where you, know, you could predict the shape of load hitting your application is before the release of a push notification. Two days ago, the FT mobile app sent out a push notification to users to notify them that the UK Supreme Court ruled against Boris Johnson's suspension of parliament. And before the push notification went out, you can see that the application was doing approximately 250,000 requests per minute. And shortly after the push went out, it reached 2.6 million requests per minute. And it wasn't just the mobile app it was impacting, it was also the website. Before the push notification went out, ft.com was hitting 200,000 requests per minute, and shortly after the push, it more than doubled to 200,000 requests per minute. So in this situation, we know the shape of load that's hitting our application, and therefore we can replicate this within our script. But, you know, it's also okay if you don't know the shape of load. The BizOps API was still in the development process, and you know, because of that, it was really difficult to predict the number of concurrent users and how they could potentially ramp in over time and in a production cycle. But this was really crucial. It was really crucial if we wanted our scripts to be as robust and accurate as possible. So if this is the case, what you might want to do is you might want to consider splitting your script into four separate phases. This way, you're capturing different types of the shape of load that's hitting your application over a production cycle. 
depending on the size of your application can really depend on how you define these phases. But I'll go on to explain to you what I thought was appropriate for the size of our application under test. So first what I did was I defined a warm-up phase. And this was the arrival rate of 10 virtual users per second for 60 seconds. Then I defined a ramp-up phase. Now this was when it went from an arrival rate of 10 to 25 new virtual users per second for 120 seconds. After that, I defined a cruise phase. And this is the arrival rate of 25 virtual users per second for the duration of 1,200 seconds. So this is a bigger duration than previous phases. And then what I did was finally, I defined a crash phase. And you know, this is the concept of finding that limit of your application and pushing past it. And for this application, it was the arrival rate of 100 virtual users per second for that very short burst of time of 30 seconds. But what's really important to note here is that there's just no point hitting your application with a load that you know it can handle. The purpose of this crash phase is to make the application crash. You know, you want to be able to understand that exact behavior of your application once you've reached past its limit. Once it's crashed, is it going to be able to recover? How long does it take to recover? Will it require engineers at the middle of the night to come into the office and make those changes? These are the types of questions you want to be able to answer from that crash phase. And to visualize this, what I've done is I've identified these four phases in the production cycle. And again, it's a graph showing the number of requests per second hitting ft.com homepage. And this is over a 24 hour period. What you can see is from 12.30 a.m. to 6 a.m., there's this very low level of requests per second of five. This is what I previously defined as the warm-up phase. Then, from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., there's this increase in the number of requests per second from five to 11, and clearly, this is during our user's daily commute, and this is what I previously defined as that ramp-up phase. Then, from 9 a.m. to midday, there's this constant level of 11 requests per second, which is the cruise phase. And finally, you can see here that what I've done is I've extrapolated the graph to demonstrate what I believe would be suitable um, for the crash phase for the size of this application. And this is approximately 40 requests per second. So now what you've done is you've decided on the testing framework, you decided the type of requests that be hitting your application and the shape of load. So now you're ready to get started and write your scripts. So let's discuss how you can get started what should your scripts look like? So what happens is the scripts are split into two separate sections. You first have the config section. And what you do is you start by choosing the target of your load test, so the address of the API server under test. In our case, it was the BizOps API, and it was the staging endpoint. The staging endpoint and the environment was an exact replication of the production environment, and so it was suitable to be able to test the staging endpoint. After that, you can specify any plugins you'd like to use. We used a plugin that allowed us to send our metrics and the output of our load test to Graphite and Grafana. What Graphite is, is it's our metrics data store and Grafana is the presentation and data visualization layer. And this was particularly helpful later on when we really needed to troubleshoot a serious performance issue. And then what you do is you define um, the load phase. 
And this is what we discussed previously about the number of concurrent virtual users and how they ramp in over time. And then we have the processor. And this is where you can import any JavaScript files that include functions you'd like to use um, by your virtual users when they're making the requests. So what you can see here is this is an above snapshot of what the config section should really look like when you're writing your scripts. After that, you have the scenario section. And this is where you identify what the virtual user's behavior is going to be during the test. So you define the type of request that's hitting the application and that your virtual users really want to make. So what you do is you start by naming the type of request. In this case, the user request was going to retrieve a list of all systems at the FT and their corresponding properties. By adding a name and providing a description, you can quickly identify in the load test how many times that particular query has been run in your load test. After that, what you do is you define the flow. So that's the array of operations that the virtual user is going to make. In the above example, you can see that what we're doing is we're making a post request to the root GraphQL with a JSON body that contains a GraphQL query. And again, you can see here that I'm calling the set headers function that I was talking about previously. And above is just a snapshot. You know, you can add as many different types of requests you'd like. And um, this is just a clear example, but on the tests that I had written, you know, we had like 10 different types of queries for each script. Um, the other thing that's really important to note, and we didn't use this, but what you can do is you can assign weights to each of the queries. What a weight does is it allows you to, it allows for the probability of a scenario being picked by a new virtual user to be weighed relative to another scenario. So above is just to illustrate this point. And what you can see is, if I made an assumption that you know, the users are twice more likely to query um, all the systems at the FT than they are to query all the health checks that are live, then you, know, you can assign that weight of two to the first query and assign a weight of one to the other, and it's as simple as that. So once you're happy with the script and you know, you've put the config and scenario section together, you're ready to go. And you can run the load test using the following command, artillery run the file path and the name of the file. OK, so you've written the script, you've run the test, now what? What Artillery will do is it will, will provide you with a summary report. Um, and that contains detailed metrics that help analyze the behavior of your application when it's under load. So to start with, you have scenarios launched. That's the number of virtual users that have launched a scenario throughout your test. Then you have scenarios completed. That's the number of virtual users that have completed a scenario throughout the test. And then you've got requests completed. Total number of HTTP requests and responses sent. RPS you know, the average number of requests per second completed throughout the test. Status codes, the HTTP status code responses from each request that has been completed. And request latency, how long it takes a server to receive and process a request. And this is measured in milliseconds. Okay, so we now understand what the metrics mean. But how can we actually use these metrics to help identify a performance issue within our application? So 
Above, what you can see here is one of the early summary reports from our script. And what we noticed was that the request latency had started to degrade rapidly during our load test. It started with 67.6 milliseconds and then suddenly ramped up to reaching a medium request latency that exceeded 30,000 milliseconds. And this was really concerning because we were only sending on average 20 requests per second. And so we were really expecting our application to be able to handle a much higher level of requests per second. Also, out of the 6,000 scenarios that were launched, more than 90% of requests received an HTTP status code 500 indicating that the server was aware of an error or it was simply incapable of performing the request. Or it received 503s indicating it actually just couldn't even hit the server. So the metrics about the response times, the throughput rates, and the status codes helped identify a serious performance issue early in early on in the development process. And it would just essentially stop our application from running. Right, so, okay, we've got this performance issue. How do we actually go about troubleshooting it and resolving it? How do we find the culprit? So what we did was we singled out each query and ran our tests several times. And we also sent these metrics to Graphite and Grafana. And after a couple of attempts, we found the culprit. It was this GraphQL query, which was trying to retrieve the first 600 systems that had a bronze service tier. In fact, what we realized was we were hitting 100% CPU when running this query, and it was at this incredibly low rate of just 10 requests per second. CPU is the central processing unit in the computer that does all the computational work. So the fact that we were reaching 100% utilization with this very low level of requests led us to believe that, you know, perhaps it really was an application issue. So. We wanted, to just, we wanted to really determine what it was in the code um, that was causing the CPU to max out. And what we believed was a good starting point was to generate a flame graph. Um, and this was in order to profile the CPU usage. And we did this by using a plugin called 0x. What you can do, again, is you can install it using NPM with the first line of code you can see above. And the second line of code, what it will do is it will generate the flame graph for you and open it in a separate browser. So it's really quick and easy to implement. And above is the flame graph that we generated. With a flame graph, all the data is on the screen at once and the hottest code paths are immediately obvious as the widest functions. But annoyingly, there was really nothing unusual that was being displayed. There wasn't a single line of code that was using up the CPU, and therefore there was nothing we could really fix within the application. So we really need to think about what else could be causing that performance issue within our application. So the next thing we thought about, so our database was a Neo4j instance, and it was run by GrapheneDB. So what happened was, was when our virtual users to make a read query using GraphQL, it would then get translated, um, and it would hit this execution layer. So in our case, it was this NPM module, and it was called Neo4j GraphQLJS. So what it does is it takes a GraphQL query and then it translates into the Cypher query. So if you take the query, for example, that was causing the performance issue, 
what this NPM module would do is it would translate it into this particular Cypher query. Um, so we wanted to, so it would get translated in Cypher query and it would, you know, run and send the request directly to our Neo4j instance. So what we wanted to do now was, you know, look into the configuration of this NPM module and see if there was a performance issue there. And what we what we discovered was that the driver had a maximum pool size of 100 connections. And so what this meant was if a session tried to acquire a connection, but the pool size was at capacity, it'd have to wait until a free connection was available. Otherwise, it would receive an HTTP status code 503, which is what we were seeing in the load test. So this seemed to suggest that you know, we, were, we could be facing a performance issue here if you know, the number of connections was exceeding this limit when running our load test. So what we did was we decided we were going to increase the number of connections and the pool size to 300 and decrease this retry timeout to 10 seconds to see if that would have an impact on that performance issue. But what we discovered was we weren't hitting that pool size capacity. And so increasing the pool size had literally no impact on this issue. So the next thing we did was we decided to look into Cypher tuning. Thankfully, with Neo4j, you can see how a particular query performs by prefixing it with the word profile. This is and this is just not specific to Neo4j. It can be used across multiple um, different types of databases. Um, we ran profile on this particular query um, to see you know, what was causing the problem and you know, what was the output. And what you're in interested to look at here is the total number of database hits um, from this query. And at the beginning, it was 14,213. The objective of query profiling is to find a way in which you can reduce that number of database hits required to perform the task whilst keeping this output level constant. So what we decided to do was create an index on service tier attribute in the hope it would improve the performance query. And this, th by doing this, it could reduce that number of database hits. So we ran profile again after we had created this index on our site for query. And um, it worked. We had significantly reduced the number of database hits by approximately 2,500. But this had no impact on our performance issue. It didn't resolve the issue. So we then looked at the configuration of our Neo4j instance. You know, what was the size of the instance? Did we have the correct RAM size? And how many cores did we have on our server? So what we did was we started by running system info in the Neo4j browser. And this provides us information about the size of our database. And from this, what we did was we used the Neo4j hardware sizing calculator to have a look at its recommendation. And its recommendation was to increase the total RAM size and increase the number of cores on our server. And potentially, you know, this recommendation could explain why the CPU was maxing out. So we did that, and we looked at the different plans. And what we also discovered was, with the current plan, we were on a shared resource. So perhaps you know, it was really critical that we move to our own dedicated resource, and that could potentially be where the performance issue was occurring. So we made the changes. We upgraded to performance one. And this had 8 gigabytes of RAM two cores on the server. And so we were pretty confident that this, this overall improvement you know, would help fix that performance issue. But confusingly, even with a dedicated resource, the overall performance had actually got worse. So we were really like, what, 
what's, ha what's next? Like, what's exactly happening to our application and our API? The next thing we thought about was, you know, perhaps this um, could be a network input output issue. Um, so when the database, uh, the database results are queued for processing by CPU, you know, if the input and output is limited, um, the queue of the database results could be back up and call, and that could potentially cause the struggling CPU. So that was essentially the next place we were looking at in terms of resolving this performance issue. So you're probably thinking, okay, you know, you've done all these troubleshooting things, you've spoken about all of them, they're clearly, you know, like, tell us already, like, what was the actual fix to this performance issue? And unfortunately, from one day to the next, the performance issue had just disappeared. We were all of a sudden able to make 25 requests per second without our application crashing. So for this particular example, we were unable to find the solution to the problem. So why have I shared this particular example with you? Because what I have learned, I believe, is really invaluable, and I want to be able to share that part with you. I've been able to build a personal toolbox with the tools and techniques that can help me identify and eradicate future culprits. But not just that, there were also practical outcomes to this investigation. What we were able to do was we were able to measure, assess, and improve the overall performance of the application. By, lo by low testing our application, what we were able to do was we were able to detect a performance issue early on in the development process, and as a result, dedicate time to help improve that performance of our application before it went into production. But not just that, we were able to assess that reliability of our application. By load testing, what we had done was we had increased our confidence that our application could stay online given a certain level of traffic and understood at what point we would need to consider scaling our application for it to stay online. So to conclude, if you want to fully understand the performance and reliability of what you're building, you should all consider load testing your application. Thank you for listening. Um, and we're also hiring, so either visit this URL or get in contact. <laughs>